Welcome to Planetary Gig Talk, Tales of Music and Magic. I'm your host, Jefferson Glassy, Chief Spiritual Dude of the Planetary Gig Society, whose mission is creating unity through music, but as I also like to say, making connections through music with the intention of bringing peace. And today I am in Studio One at the worldwide headquarters of the Planetary Gig Society, and I'm very excited and looking forward to being able to talk with a musician and media technologist, David Julian Gray. David, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Well, certainly, I'm very happy to be here. Looking forward to it. Um, so I haven't, not sure we've met, uh, possibly at some point, but uh, we have a mutual friend, Pearl Bayless, who suggested that you would be a great person to talk with. And just based on some of the preliminary stuff that we've been exchanging, uh, that is certainly the case. Um, and so you, you just, as of now you play, um, what instruments do you play and what kind of, um, music? Is My main folks? instrument, um, is the clarinet. I've been playing the clarinet for, uh, 60 years, almost. Cool. Um, it, it chose me. I didn't choose it, but it's the instrument I, I play with Pearl. We play in, uh, in a kind of full time blues band that her family runs called Capitol Hillbillies. And I've been playing with them for about 20 years. Uh, I moved to the area 22 years ago. I met them pretty quickly after that and moved playing with them. Uh, I also play klezmer music, full time Eastern European Jewish uh, dance band music. I played that, it was my full time gig for about a dozen years. In cool. my 20s and early 30s. Uh, got to travel the whole world doing that, make records. Uh, got a Grammy nomination. We didn't win, but we got nominated. Awesome. And uh, you know, also play guitar and oud, mandolin, um, saxophone. But the clarinet has been the main one. And as I said, uh, I didn't choose it. it. It chose me. I, I played it in high school band, not very seriously. But then when I put myself out as a musician, hoping to make it as a you know r rock guitar hero, like some <laughs> yeah. other. Yeah. Um, and I was playing in various bands, and people would always say, "Well, what what else do you do? What else can you bring to the table?" I said, oh, I like playing that. And uh, people just kept saying, "Well, do that. We like that. Do that." So after a while, I found a repertoire I really loved on the clarinet, and decided, "Okay, I guess this was meant to be." And that repertoire is, uh, you know, first the Jewish music, but that wasn't my entry into it. It was really uh, Greek, Greek, uh, old time Greek and Bulgarian dance band music. And through wow. that, I, uh, I got more into the music of my own people, music that I heard as a little kid, and made that a specialization for a while. And still, it's the core, of, the core of what I do. Well, you at least as, as a player, it's the core of what I do. Yeah, well, you're very eclectic musically. I wish I had all had been playing all that amount of time and had the background that that you've had or ability to to do that. Um, how did you kind of come into music? Was you did your parents um, play music? Was there a lot of music in the household? Uh, were they musicians or they weren't musicians? But there was music in the household. My dad was very musical, although he he didn't play an instrument other than whistling. But he was he was a fine whistler, you know, like a, a real virtuoso. He got those beautiful trills and melismas, and he whistled all the time. But mostly he listened, and uh, he loved music. He had a large record collection with an emphasis on late 19th, early 20th century French and Spanish composers, like Foray and Debussy, Albanez. Uh, he loved that stuff, but he also liked uh, you know, straight ahead. Uh, classical, classical Mozart, Beethoven. Played a lot of that. Swing, we heard it all the time. There was always music in the car. They listened to a popular program called Make Believe Ballroom. And I believe it was Make Believe uh, Ballroom's playlist that originally really uh, made music central to my own life. I remember this very well, uh, at least one occasion, hearing Walter Houston's famous recording of uh, September song, Kurt Vile, Ogden Nash song from the play Knickerbocker Holiday. And Walter Houston's really not a, a singer, he's a great actor, but he put that across. It was very popular, popular enough so that it was still being played 
18 years after it was released, when I was four years old, and I remember hearing that one time riding in the car and just being so mesmerized. I'd never experienced anything so beautiful in my life. Just, I don't know if your listeners know the song. But, you know, oh, it's a long, long time from May to December. The days grow short when you reach September's famous song. And when it gets to the part where it goes, November, or September, November. And uh, it's written by Kurt Vile, sophisticated musically. And something about it captured me. Yeah, it just and grabbed you, huh? From that moment on, I just, I'd never experienced such pleasure before. And her was four years old, small enough that was lying on the back ledge of our 1952 Hudson Hornet. And uh, kids can't do that anymore, thank God. Um, but music from that point on just became the most important thing to me. I would sing, I sang in chorus in school, I would make up songs. I started making up songs so long ago, I don't remember, but I just loved to make up songs as I walked along. And uh, eventually a, a buddy of mine in third grade, we were invited to learn instruments and he said, I'm gonna learn the clarinet. If you also play clarinet, we can sit together in band and be, you know, goof off together. And that sounded attractive. So I said, okay, I'll learn the clarinet. My folks got me private lessons, but I never took it seriously until I was in the uh, I did take music seriously. Uh, you know, I, I got a transistor radio. My dad gave me a transistor radio when I was eight years old. I fell in love with rock and roll. Um, and I uh, heard Mike Bloomfield and the Butterfield Blues Band when I was 13 years old. And uh, that was, again, a, a, another kind of religious experience for me. I heard uh, East West by the Butterfield Blues Band. And that's when I became really serious about music. I wanted to live in that world. If I could create something that was exciting and immediate of that, the way he was playing it was like his life depended on it. And I felt that and I wanted to be part of that. You could create something so immediate. That's that's really very um, cool and amazing. You know, I wish I was that precocious to have. You know, I we all grow up with music, but it's you know, row, row, row your boat and that sort of thing. And and to have uh, really taken to it, or maybe just listened to the call uh, that early is 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 really great. And uh, you know, you can't you can't go wrong with music as part of your life. So I, I envy you there and. Um, Quite an eclectic, uh, as I said, you know, background and a lot of stuff going on there. So, so for the last X number of years, you have been music has been your pretty much your life. You've been playing, traveling the world, doing all kinds of music everywhere. Um, well, I would say my whole life. You know, I, I do remember four is when it became my greatest pleasure and my favorite activity. Um, I, although I never practiced, I admit to that, <laughs> I did manage to become a professional musician and I traveled the world uh, playing music in my 20s and, and 30s. And then uh, through, through doing musical research, I got into um, digital audio processing and that gave me a second career that um, luckily was more lucrative than playing, but that's not why I pursued it. I pursued it because it was kind of grabbed me in a similar way in my uh, mid thirties, it became a little more interesting. And luckily everything just worked out. Uh, I never looked for a job, I've always been given opportunities. So I realized it took me a long time, but I realized how lucky I've been. Most people don't have that, you know, I don't know what else to call it, grace. And, uh, I've just been very, very lucky. Managed to do things I love and fascinated by. Uh, it's all worked out. But two kids seems to hold one house, what can I say? That's it's worked out. Yeah, very, very, very special. I think you are very lucky there. So, I also know that you're you're sort of a, a student of of music, not just playing, not just listening, but sort of more in of a in a scientific um, area. I mean, you sent me some information that you've written about the Uber string theory, and you know, recently on on this podcast, we've been having some good conversations about things like music of, of the spheres and. And uh, you know the 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 fact uh, tone is sort of sped up rhythm or rhythm is slowed down tone and how it, how everything is made out of vibration and 
I find that all that fascinating, and I'd love to just hear your take on some of your your basic, you know, thoughts, beliefs about, you know, music, vibration, how it all interrelates to us, life, you know, whatever you want to talk about, because I just find it fascinating. Well, it's absolutely true. Uh, um, I don't know what you can say is true, but I firmly believe, and I think there's a lot of empirical evidence to support this, and certainly a lot of subjective evidence that all that we experience as so-called reality is the intersection of vibrations. And when you're a musician, that that's you you are involved in that, not in some very abstract way, like the way of an astrophysicist or a mathematician or a cosmologist might. But that but that's what you're doing. You're you're causing the air to vibrate. And if you're making music with other people, you're trying to find a pleasant and euphonic way for your vibrations to interact with their vibrations and create new things. As I mentioned, music was my whole life and I took it very seriously. And in as much as, uh, although I didn't practice and, and become as great a player as maybe I could have, I still pursued it very seriously and I studied um, music theory uh, in high school. And luckily we, we had a path that you could uh, do that um, starting early on so you could get to a pretty good level. And as a senior in high school, we started learning about um, the theories of a German music theorist named uh, Heinrich Schenker. Hmm. And Heinrich Schenker had a uh, um, method of harmonic analysis that, to put it in grossly simplistic terms, um, but not terribly inaccurate, just terribly simplistic, that um, pretty much all the world's music, and to him, that just meant Western European art music. All the world's music is basically uh, three blind mice in the treble against uh, one, uh, five, one in the bass. Uh, actually, I sang, I didn't sing that right. Uh, 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 uh. So you have that in the bass and uh, bah, bah, in the treble. And he came up with an analysis that was taken very seriously. It, it actually, it, it has to do with the kind of tonal gravity concept. And the way my teacher presented it, uh, as if it really were, you know, gravity or like chemistry with balances. And that resonated with me and it seemed to be true. And as I, uh, in, in high school and then very, very much so uh, uh, in my early 20s, I started getting into many other musics from around the world. Uh, I'd been listening to them through high school, but I actually started to learn, um, well, of course, uh, you know, old time Jewish music, which is uh, a first cousin to um, Istanbul, you know, the gypsy cabaret music from Istanbul. That and the Jewish dance band music are our first cousins, a lot of overlap in the repertoire. And Greek music has a, a lot of overlap. And then Romanian is like a second cousin, it's not much overlap, but very similar use of the modes. Uh, you know, these were not considered Western European art music types. And people said, well, you know, they follow their own rules. And I was thinking, no, they don't <laughs> follow the same rules. They just, you know, they just are in a different corner. And, and there are these things, there's a valence to it all. And if you, you create a pitch, uh, if you establish a tonal center and then you go off somewhere else, like, like the most common mode, um, uh, once you get to the, uh, eastern edge of Europe, and certainly you get into Central Asia. Um, very common mode. It's the most common mode, and it's as if you uh, took the harmonic minor scale and made the fifth step of it your, your tonal center. And the the way the gravity works is similar to the way it would work if you were playing natural minor and threw in a secondary dominant chord to firmly establish your tonal center. So I thought it was completely wrong that they said, no, this is music is based on cultural whims and uh, just the happenstance of you know, uh, what cultures might come up with. And it has nothing to do with 
vibrating bodies and natural laws. Um, in the early, early days of ethnomusicology, German academics um, were starting to develop that field in the late 19th, early 20th century. And they believed this, but they were very Eurocentric. So in the 60s and 70s, when the field got a whole new generation of young, open-minded uh, practitioners and academics, they, uh, you know, it was very unpopular to be Eurocentric in those days. You have to give full credence to, to all these other cultures. You can't call them primitive. And, and I believe that very strongly, that's very nice. But they kind of threw out the baby with the bathwater, saying, no, you know, they, every, every culture comes up with its own idea of, of what's euphonic and what sounds good and what's dissonance and what's consonance and what, what works and what doesn't work. And has nothing to do with vibrating bodies. That's just an old Eurocentric European concept. But I, I held firmly to that belief. And uh, I want what you mentioned is uber string theory, which has been a pet project of mine for ridiculously long period of time. I'm not a good academic, so. Uh, is that all, all the world's musics are, are, uh, want to obey natural laws. And I think this tells us something about where consciousness might fit in with cosmology. Uh, mm. Right now, there's a field of philosophy, uh, consciousness studies, which is different than um, neurology. Neurologists are mapping how the brain works in really exciting ways. And there's a lot of people in music theory and music and cognition who are working on what's happening in your brain when you listen to music? What's happening in your brain when you make music? How is it like, say, meditation? And how is it like other forms of cognition? Right. And that's different than the, than other, than the philosophical end of consciousness studies who are trying to find out where does consciousness fit in the standard model of physics. Um, I know that a lot of people who think in terms of higher consciousness and spirituality might say, well, these are higher realms than what uh, astrophysicists might look at or what cosmologists who are working with mathematical formulas. And we're trying to find a grand unified theory, such as Einstein tried in the latter part of his career, to find some mathematical formula that would join the weak uh, nuclear force and the strong nuclear force and electromagnetism and gravity. Yeah. And you know, the and theory, he, theory and of everything, it, sort of, right? Theory exactly, of everything. Exactly. The yeah. theory of everything. And they, uh, the Germans called this the grand unified theory, or the, I, I don't know German that well. Uh, but the, it would come to gross, uh, whatever it is, it comes out to G-U-T, which is the word, the German word for God that wasn't an accident. Um, so even if, you know, they don't believe in a, a kind of God of uh, European religions, they still, you know, felt like there's some big divine force out there and you could express it mathematically. And there are people who believe that, well, consciousness doesn't fit here. Consciousness has something to do with higher realms that we'll never discover if we're just looking at mathematical formulas. And I've always believed that if it's true that we have these higher levels of consciousness that we can experience, uh, you know, the spiritual world and, and the, the world of higher consciousness is not other than the world that the natural philosophers, which is the old term for what we now call physics. You know, back in Newton's day, they called, they didn't have the word physics. It kind of emerged at the tail end of his life and the people who followed on to him. Up to his time, they called it natural philosophy. And so the, the world of natural philosophy should encompass these higher levels of consciousness or, or just, I don't know if it's higher, but just a, a deeper state and a more keen state of awareness. And to get to, to your main theme, I know I'm talking, I'm talking, I'm talking. No, this is so fascinating, theme, so fascinating. P peace through music, um, I firmly believe, because um, I'm of an age where I, I was able to experience altered states of consciousness, both through uh, deep uh, concentration on my music, deep concentration uh, in, in work, but, but also through other 
uh, aids that may have been easier to acquire. Right. Um, but I found them to be the same thing, you know, whether it was ah. uh, psychedelic or just a really intense period of, uh, of, of playing or practicing. Uh, kind of, so, well, this feels the same. I'm, I'm in a state of heightened awareness now. And um, you know, I'm feeling uh, these vibrations as, as it's not an abstract concept. I'm, I'm manipulating them. This is the, the real world. And those experiences led me to firmly believe that anything that you, people talk about uh, from the spiritual side and, and religion of uh, reaching heightened awareness expanded consciousness is something that is as real as the uh, the orbit of the sun within the Milky Way or the earth around the sun or the moon or, you know, and, and the way they interact with each other. Or for that matter, to get back to the theme. Uh, the pentatonic scale or something. Uh, yes, exactly right. Why, when you have a pentatonic scale, the... Do, does a certain note want to fall to another note, depending on how you shape your melody? What, and, and also the feelings we get. Why, um, say in North African, uh, excuse me, North Indian music, um, where they'll, the, if they bend a note out of the, where it sits naturally within the mode they've established, you know, the allop section of a raga, I don't want to sound like I'm an expert on a very little bit. But, um, they'll 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 bend the pitch in a certain way to create a certain feeling. They study that. We you know in Western music we don't really study that. But there are uh, you can get very mathematical, and there are Indian um, music theorists who have worked out the math in ways that, uh, which is why I, I thought I was on the right track. Even though when I tried to go to school in the early '70s, they it was out of fashion, and they, they thought I was quaint and silly. <laughs> the undercurrent of, I think, what you're saying is that it's, it's sort of all connected through the vibrations and the consciousness and the, the music and, and, I guess, you know, matter that we can touch or feel we can touch. Um, but it, it, it seems really profound to me and in some ways makes a lot more sense than, you know, dude dude sitting up in the clouds um or you know some of these other uh beliefs that folks have about what life is about i mean i just find it it it's again fascinating so in the little paper that you sent on the uber string theory uh there there was some discussion about um the tritone and how that kind of interacts and i i didn't quite understand i didn't understand a lot of what what it was that you sent except for just sort of generally, but uh, could you talk a little bit about that? And maybe if I took you on a tangent by asking that question, if you want to get back to where you were, that would be fine too, because I, it's, it's, it's great stuff. Oh, no, that, that's not, that's directly related to what we're talking about. So um, there is something called gravity that there's a tr tremendous amount of empirical evidence for. We don't go floating off the face of the earth. Yep. The Earth maintains a, a reasonably constant uh, orbit around the sun. Of course, we know it's not really constant, and at some point in the far future, we'll get absorbed into the sun and burn up. And the same with the moon and, and asteroid belts. And on a, on a smaller level, there's uh, the uh, forces within... Uh, the subatomic world, you know, and that's how we can speak to each other. That's I. Well, that's interesting. That, that, that um, my bird clock. You might be hearing my bird clock. Ah, okay. <laughs> so I have a thought in my head, and I know how to express it to some degree by making words. So I push some air up from my diaphragm through my mouth, and I create vibrations in the air. And these vibrations are caught by a magnet inside this microphone device in front of me, which turns it into voltages. And it sends a, a wave of voltages 
into a little box on my desk that turns it into a series of uh, ones and zeros. And then it goes into the computer and it comes out and goes over the internet. But uh, so that's all vibrations and numbers and it's, it's related, it's different then, but related to, and of course Einstein, Einstein spent a great deal of the last half of his life trying to get, work out the numbers and never could. Uh, it's all similar to gravity and, and the exact same thing as, as the electromagnetic force. It is the electromagnetic force that makes this happen, but not when I, not when I speak, that's, that's all just physical, but it all gets translated one to the other and it's all just vibrations interacting. And to get back to your question about tritones, so I think music in our consciousness, this is where it ties in with consciousness. When we hear, I'm going to try to sing a uh, tritone, I don't know how good I am. Uh, Fa wants to go to Ray. T wants to go to me. Do, re, mi, fa, mi. Do, ti, do. T and fa are exactly a half of an octave. That's at least in tempered music, I'll get into that in a moment. Uh, they're half of an octave. Uh, if you divide scale, uh, scalar steps, if you give scalar steps numbers, um, you have a, a fifth, do, fa, and you have a, a fourth, excuse me, do, fa, and do, so, so, do, so, it's a fifth. In between fa and sol is halfway between an octave, between a fourth and a fifth, and augmented fourth. That's the tritone, and you get it naturally between fa and t. Uh. Now, what's when you establish, when you create um, a context, because all these things only exist in context. You have to, that's why where consciousness comes in. When you create a context that we have a tonality, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, Ti, Do, Ti, Fa, So, Fa, Mi, Re, Do, Ti, Do, Ti, Do. So I'm establishing Do, but I just picked a note at random. I don't have a perfect picture or anything like that. But I create a context where Fa and T now have natural, uh, another, you know, mixing gravity and the electromagnetic force. But in chemistry, uh, we call we talk about valences where unstable compounds want to you know bond with with other elements that might be in the area and become other things. So Fa and T are the tritone, and they want to resolve. They create a tension that our minds want to resolve. Um, as music gets more sophisticated, you can go out of. You mentioned the pentatonic scale. Let's. Um, I won't make a, without making a value judgment, it's just a less uh, sophisticated or rich set of pitches. That doesn't mean that you can't make, you know, beautiful and even sophisticated music with it. Do, re, mi, so, la, do, la, so, mi, re, do. So it's simpler. You don't get the same kind of tension. Um, you can do simpler things with it. You can make, uh, you, your tunes don't have the same, Complexity? Well, they just, well, they won't set up the same kind of tension because you've done away with the tritone. That's what, ah. that's what you don't have. You have five notes instead of seven. What you're missing is that tritone. You're missing, so uh, you can float in space with greater ease. You're not creating expectations. The, the thing is when you create a tonal context and you introduce the tritone that exists in that tonal context, you're creating an expectation that that the note will go somewhere. Before we had pianos and Western European art music, uh, every, you know, do, re, mi, uh, starting uh, was, all those notes just existed in relationship to the do. And then equal temperament came in as European composers wanted to try fancier things. Basically what they wanted to do is they wanted to borrow T from another key so they could establish another note as Do, either temporarily, maybe just for a measure, maybe just for part of a measure. Bach does it all the time. He's, he's the master. To me, and I, I've listened and played and studied music from all over the world, and uh, you know, I, I've listened to great 
oud players from Iran and, uh, and Iraq and, uh, and Turkey. And I've listened to Ravi Shankar and uh, Ali Akbar Khan a lot. And, and of course, many lesser musicians is, and of course, all the greats. But to me, uh, Johann Sebastian Bach was the, the greatest, grandest revealer of the divine in music of all time. Oh, and wow. He would play this, this con he would play with this concept all the time. Even one of his simplest pieces, the first piece from the Well-Tempered Clavier, um, Prelude in C Major, find it on eBay, on YouTube. You can, <laughs> it's easy, easy to find. Uh, Prelude uh, number one in C Major from the Well-Tempered Clavier. Um, it's a very simple piece, but he, he goes, he sets up some really interesting uh, tensions by playing with the tritone. He's got a couple of times when he has a chord that has two tritones in it because he <laughs> borrows notes from other kids. That's where it comes from. And when once you do that, that that's jazz players and classical uh, players know it really well. It's called a fully diminished chord, and it's a great trick uh, to use. It's a nice little tool. You have two tritones. There are four natural, there are four perfect resolutions from a well, an equal tempered fully diminished chord. Because tritones can either implode or out or explode depending on the, the context. If you're, a, if you're not in tempered music, if you're in justly intoned music, fa wants to go to me, fa me, and t wants to go to ti do. Um, you don't have a choice. T's gonna go to do, fa is gonna go to me. But if you're tempered, which is all the notes are out of tune, but they're out of tune in this very mathematically precise way so that our ears trick us into thinking, well, they're, I think they're in tune. And all the music you hear, all pop music made with computers and all orchestral music of the last 200 years is, is equal to 250 years, is all equal tempered. And what you can do with that is you can take your fa T and fool people into thinking, nope, it's not the fa T that I told you it was two minutes ago. It's T fa, and instead of uh, exploding, it's imploding, and you go to a whole other key. So it's to trick the jazz musicians and classical musicians who have been using for a couple hundred years. Wow, it's wild. Um, so one of the th one of the things but, I'm also but, but, but the real power of music just is the real power of music is not in playing these tricks in tempered music, even though that's mostly what we listen to nowadays, and that's certainly pianos don't have a choice to be there. But the real power comes when you're justly in tone, when you're playing the the real pitches, not the not the compromised pitches to let us have pianos and orchestral music but the real pitches that, that are naturally from the vibrations. Because if you, every vibrating body breaks up into um, tractions of itself. And most of them, particularly the ones we choose to make musical instruments with in most of the world, they'll break up into integer fractions. So you get um, the entire body is vibrating. Think like a violin string or guitar string. A guitar string is vibrating as the whole length of the string from the nut to the to the saddle and it's also vibrating in half that's when you play harmonics that's what you're doing you're breaking the whole vibration and you're letting the, the partial vibration through so you get the the whole thing and a half of it the third of it which is an octave and a fifth and a fourth of it which is two octaves and a fifth which is two octaves and a third and that third is the natural third justly intoned third and that's a more beautiful sound to a human being or any living creature um, than the one that you have on the piano, which is a compromise to let you do these fancy tricks. Wow. Um, do you think you could try explaining that just intonation again, or maybe just for, for people like me who didn't may not get it all, but it's, it's a more pure tone because it's not, how, how would you say? It's, it's based on, well, when I sing, uh, actually, let me sing a lower tone so I can demonstrate some of it. There are, there are some people out there in the world who, can, who really know how to demonstrate this. I am not one of them. There's some German woman out there who knows how to play harmonics on her vocal cords. She's amazing. This is what Tuvin throat singing is based on. I don't know if you know that. I think some of you are listening. Right, right. I've heard of that. Sing. Uh, when I sing that, I am also simultaneously singing. <laughs> yeah, right. Except that that up tune. I told you I couldn't do it, but the idea is that every vibrating body, whether it's my vocal cords or a violin string or a brake shoe, uh, you decided you wanted to put uh, 
a, a violin bow on a break shoe, they make very nice tones. Um, mm -hmm. Whatever it is, it breaks up into fractions of itself. And most of the materials we decide to make musical instruments with, like um, you know, strings of uh, steel or nylon and uh, uh, you know, wooden tubes, uh, silver tubes, where, you know, there's many flutes are made out of silver or whatever it is, bamboo. These materials, they break up into the integer fractions. When they break up into fractions, which they all do, the materials we find sound good, and this is why we, they sound good, they break up into the integer fractions. And the half, you know, so one to one is the whole thing, and that's your fundamental tone. One to two is the octave. Right. One to three, when it breaks up into thirds, or three to one, is an octave and a fifth. That's, and then uh, you get an octave and a fifth, then you get the second octave, two octaves and a third. Uh, then you get... Uh, that's, uh, into seven. Then you get another octave, that's uh, three octaves. And then you get um, the ninth, I believe, is a second. And uh, then they start getting too high to hear. So a lot of people, and that's what we call just intonation, when it's based on the vibration. And what, where I differ with many other uh, people who talk about this as part of music theory is they'll go out to and say, well, you know, 16 to 1 is, well, 16 to 1 is an octave, so that's easy. Well, 17 to 1 is such and such a pitch. I'm not exactly sure what 17 to 1 is. But there, those pitches are so high because you break, you know, if, if at 8 to 1 you're already three octaves above, you know, by the time you get to 16, that's four octaves, 17, you're, uh, you're, you're getting hard to, to tell a pitch at that point. It's uh -huh. just way too high. Um, but the first... 11 overtones, you get a lot of octaves in there, a couple of fifths, make a dominant seventh chord, which has the fir your first tritone in it. So if you were, if C is your main, your, your fundamental pitch, if you play a C on a, on a really, on a good instrument that has a very rich tone, certainly an oboe or a violin, which, have, which are very rich in overtones, um, you're actually playing a dominant seventh chord that wants to resolve. And, and I believe that our sense of pitch not, comes not from the fundamentals, but from our desire to resolve that tritone. Mm. Then you actually, if you do that, then you can get do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, and all the modes that are built on that, like uh, you know, the minor mode and Dorian, which is a lot of music is in. And then um, the other more complex modes, like this key jaws I mentioned before, which is in, in uh, the gypsy and Jewish music that I love so much. Uh, that's borrowing. So say you were in uh, A minor and in order to, to get the T of A, you borrow your G sharp from uh, the key of A major, um, but you, you take the justly in tone version. And that's what I find in the little analysis I've done, what folk musicians and uh, the classical musicians of the Arabic, Persian and Indian traditions uh, that's what they're doing when they play their more sophisticated lines and they borrow notes from other modes to get the, those feelings in there. They're playing them justly in tone. Those musics are justly in tone. Um, I've just, again, it's just really fascinating. Um, but let me kind of ask, so it, it, it seems to me that this, this type of information is really important. It's sort of complicated for a lot of people, obviously, me. But... Uh, what do you think there are things that we could do to, you know, get more understanding about music out there and what can we do with more understanding about music to really kind of, you know, maybe make things better on the planet? I mean, it seems to me that there may be a connection there. Does that, does that fit? Is that a question that makes sense to you? Sure. And, and I think it does fit. Um, you asked me about the Uberstring theory, so of course I've wandered off there because so I'd love to talk about it. But um, we were also talking earlier about consciousness and trying to attain higher states. I, I think music is a great path to that. And I also think, you know, even though so many societies and religions um, try to teach people what moral behavior is, I think if you can attain 
a higher state of consciousness, it's just going to flow naturally. And people yeah. will, people will, what the Buddhists call right behavior. You know, you, you will have a higher degree of empathy and you will recognize yourself and your needs in other people. And so the, your first question is, what, what can we do with music to, to try to have a more peaceful and empathetic world? I think playing music. I can't <laughs> imagine what else to say. Um, something I, th I think was a, it's a tragedy. And I think uh, I don't have any empirical evidence. I don't know if there have been any studies, but it used to be that you were not considered an educated person if you couldn't play music, you know, both in... Um, I think that's mostly true in, in the upper and upper middle classes in all societies all over the world. Um, but I think that's less and less true. Again, in all societies all over the world, uh, music, when I was going to school, and I'm very grateful for this, was a requirement. You couldn't get out of going to music class. And uh, most people were encouraged to be in chorus. And then at a certain point, you were encouraged to learn an instrument. And that's just not so true anymore. So many school systems, particularly in communities that have fewer resources, it's one of the first things to go. And I think that's, right. that's wrong because, um, you know, people need to learn how to read and add, uh, you know, do, do basic arithmetic and math. But um, I don't think people need to pass standardized tests more than they need to to know how to harmonize with their neighbor. Ah, yes. You, you, you'd, you'd, you'd go to a chorus and, and you'd sing one part and the, and the altos would sing another part. Unless you're an alto, that's what part you're singing. But you'd, you'd make harmony. Uh, or at least you'd make a nice unison. Your teacher would try to make sure everybody was singing the same pitch. And I think that that leads to a greater degree of empathy than, than learning morality out of a book. Boy, that's that's pretty profound, it, and it makes sense to me. It's almost saying, you know, when you're when you're playing uh, music, singing, making, harmonizing with your friends and neighbors, it's it's hard to. I mean, you're you're you sort of were automatically empathetic. You're automatically more in a um, harmonious situation than, you know, fighting one another that sort of thing. It just makes sense. I, I think so. And as I mentioned before, you're, you're, everything is vibration. You mentioned at the beginning here that the whole world, you know, our perception of whatever this reality is and, and our existence is all the intersections of, of various vibrating bodies. And that's what super string theory is about. Is that there are these strings and, and the way they interact creates this illusion of, of reality and, and solid space when you're playing music you're directly manipulating vibrations at, of the air and the way they interact uh, can create tension and resolve tension and uh, when you do it with a, with other people or when you do it in a performance for other people but I think even better than that is to make music with other people um, the way you resolve those tensions uh, can be a source of delight of course you know there are perverse people who will do the opposite but i think the main goal is <laughs> to so, surprise to to try to res to create um some sense of beauty um or you know then it's not beautiful humor whatever it is or or just to express a feeling maybe uh if you're down uh, you just need to express that let other people know and there's you know, maybe less beauty and less resolution of tension, but it's a way of drawing people to you that, you know, this guy needs some support in some way, some companionship. It makes makes it a lot. It should be beautiful. Yeah, it absolutely makes a lot of sense. All right, well, I really do appreciate it, uh, David, Julian, Gray. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time. You know, we're I think we're all doing the best we can here, and music is certainly a, a good way to go about it. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. Right, take care. You've been listening to Planetary Gig Talk, Tales of Music and Magic. I'm your host, Jefferson Glassy, Chief Spiritual Dude of the Planetary Gig Society. 
We talk with musicians and others about the power of music and how we can use music to help create a better world. Please check out our website, www.planetarygigs.org, for information about some of the organizations promoting music and musicians. Resources about the power of music. Books, movies, articles, including new research on music and the brain. We welcome your support. The Planetary Gig Society is a Section 501c3 charitable organization, and you can donate on the website. You also can receive a free email signature block demonstrating your support for Planetary Gig Society. Please follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Planetary Gigs. And we want to thank fabulous musician and teacher Eric Weinberg of Little Eric Studios for the Planetary Gig Talk music titled Chill Kid, It's Saul. So please check out Planetary Gig Talk on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. Subscribe and hear all the upcoming episodes. Thanks very much. Thank you.